All right, welcome to the chapter called The Introduction to Real Estate. This is the business that you and I have chosen to go into. Now, throughout this book, this course, we are going to be discussing the conveyance of real property. So you might want to write that word down because the conveyance is the transfer from one person to another of real property. We are going to discuss this and go through all of the ways that this can happen. The funny thing is that you and I are probably going to use the term buyers and sellers because in that conveyance, there can be an exchange of money. And that's usually when you and I are involved. But do not forget that there could be a gift of real property. There could be a donation. There could be a lease of real property. And all of those use different words. And we will get to the legal terminology. But for now, in this conveyance, we are going to talk about buyers and sellers are the name that you and I will call them most of the time. In this conveyance of real property on an annual basis, there are literally trillions of dollars of that exchange hands, making it the largest piece of the economic uh, transactions on an annual basis. There's more money that changes hands in the United States than the value of all of the companies that are on the New York Stock Exchange. That's how large this piece of economic data is. And you and I get to play in that field. Now, I want to remind you that there is an outline for every chapter that I will follow. It is probably right up here. It's probably the one right above this first video. And then at the end of the videos, there's always going to be a quiz for this chapter, all right? So this outline is going to allow you to kind of follow what I'm going through and take notes or take notes somewhere else. And then we have the quiz at the end to test your knowledge. That is the structure basically of every chapter we are going to do. So this first chapter is called the introduction to real estate. Let's get started. In this business of conveyance or this business of real property, there are many people that play a role that are used during this conveyance. And on the screen is a list of all of the people. Actually, it's not all of the people. There are actually some others. So let's go through these people and their role in this process. The first one that we're going to talk about is brokerage. This is what you and I are involved in. The brokerage is nothing more than bringing a buyer and a seller together. And there are all kinds of brokers in this world. There are pawn brokers. There are boat brokers. There are drug brokers. There are real estate brokers. That is the specific category that you and I are involved in. We are going to be bringing buyers and sellers of real property together. And for that, we are going to get paid a commission. All right. And oftentimes you see this group right here as the linchpin in the real estate transaction. We are probably the most common person people think of when they start going, oh, I need to buy some real estate. I better call a real estate broker. All right. So there are a lot of other people that are involved, all these people down here that will actually come to you to seek business because everybody assumes or knows rightfully that we are probably the first step in most of this process. Now, occasionally you will see that maybe financing, somebody will say, well, I should talk to a, a mortgage guy so I know how much I get, but that is few and far between. That's probably 5% of the population. Other than that, it's us, all right? 
So a lot of these other people that play roles will come to you for business, all right? The next person that's in here is the appraiser or the appraisal. Now, the appraisal is an estimated opinion of a highly educated person. A lot of times we all look at this person as the uh, <clears throat> smartest one of the group because they're the ones that do all of the math, okay? <clears throat> but they are trained and they are educated in a very specific manner to ensure that every appraiser in the United States will get the exact same answer, no matter who does the appraisal. We are going to do a whole chapter and discuss that process by which they actually will form an opinion for the value of a property, all right? Um, the appraiser is actually works for who? This is the one of the first questions. Who does the appraiser work for? Well, here's a little insight to that chapter. They actually work for the lender, all right? A lot of people say, well, they work for the buyer. No, no, no. They are often paid by the buyer but they are there to represent the lender's interest to make sure that the lender is not loaning too much money. So they are working for the actual lender. They are paid for by the buyer, that I agree with, but that's not who they work for. Uh, I wanna to touch back on one thing back up here at the brokerage. In a brokerage, remember, we bring buyers and sellers together. So here's the first question of the day. Can a real estate broker get paid on a deal that does not close? What I want you to do is hit the pause button, think about it and come back. All right, so you're back. <laughs> the question was, can a real estate broker get paid without a deal getting closed? Now, think back to when I told you what a broker does. A broker brings together a buyer and a seller. Notice in that definition, nowhere did I say, and the deal closes. The answer is yes, I most assuredly can get paid if a deal doesn't close. I have probably been paid about 12 times in my career on deals that didn't close. And I know what you're thinking. You're already out there saying, well, this guy's crazy. Here we are in chapter one, and he's already making ludicrous statements. No, trust me. Well, we tried to buy a house, and we couldn't get a loan. I'm like, okay, stop. Time out. You said you couldn't get a loan. That's actually not a buyer. So in essence, that broker did not bring a buyer and a seller together. And there are a whole bunch of things called contingencies, which we will get to, that are legal ways to get out of the process. Home inspections, appraisal values, uh, getting able to get a loan. So the words you need to think about are ready, willing, and able. When you bring a ready, willing, and able buyer to a ready, willing, and able seller, and they form the purchase agreement, I have earned my money. So yes, I can get paid. What I'm talking about is a situation where a buyer wakes up one morning and goes, well, I don't like the color purple. I've decided not to buy. That I can get paid on. I had a deal several years ago, my client, my buyer were uh, sitting at the closing table and he looked across the table to the seller. And in this particular case, my buyer was buying like 21 condos in a housing edition or in a condo edition. And he sat down and he said, gentlemen, I have made a grievous error. When I did the math, I did not figure in the monthly condo association fee. And when I do that now, I am upside down on this deal. I will be losing money every month. So what I'm prepared to do, and he looked over to the seller and he said, how much earnest money are you holding? And the seller said, well, I'm holding $10,000. 
He's like, okay, keep that. And he looked to me. Now, this is my own client and was actually a good friend of mine. And he looked at me and he said, Raymond, what are you going to make? I said, Dale, I was going to make about a $9,000 commission. He said, would you take $7,500 down? Now, I said yes because I was the managing broker, and we will get into all that. But I had the legal power to accept that. And I said, yeah, Dale, I'd do that. And he literally took his checkbook out and wrote me a check for $7,500, ripped it out, handed it to me, and said, gentlemen, have a good day. Literally closed his briefcase, got up, and walked out. That is a case where <clears throat> the buyer made a mistake in his math. He had no legal out, so he was forced to, A, lose his earnest money, and B, actually pay a commission. I had a second one several years ago where I was the property manager, and we're actually going to talk about that coming up, where he wanted me to find him a tenant, and for that, I was going to get paid. So I brought him a tenant that qualified, and Lee said, Thank you very much, but I've changed my mind. I've decided to go ahead and sell the property. Can we list it for sale? I'm like, yes, we certainly can. But you owe me $500 for the tenant. He's like, well, well why? I, I have decided to sell it. I'm like, well, yeah, but that's because you changed your mind. I did what you hired me to do. I brought you a valid tenant, and now you don't want to lease? That's not my issue. You owe me money, and he paid. So there are plenty of cases where you could potentially earn a commission on deals that may not close, and we will get in further in depth when we start talking about that. Now, a third person that people look at are property managers. Property managers are licensed individuals that require uh that require a license and people hire them to manage their property. Now, the funny thing about property management is there are a myriad of examples. Um, some of the states in the Northeast, and I think it's Vermont and New Hampshire, do not require a, man, a license to manage property. Some states like Nevada require a second license. They must have a real estate license, and then they go back to school to get a second property manager license. And then there are some states like Florida, uh, Indiana, that allow you to manage property underneath your actual real estate license. They work under a unified license. So Indiana is a very common one. The license that you get to broker real estate also allows you to manage properties. So you see three different scenarios. One doesn't require any license. There are some that require a second or an advanced license. And then there are some that just say, hey, with your real estate license, this is one of the activities that you would be allowed to do. The next person in this group is going to be involved in the financing of this transaction. Now, not all transactions require financing. There are some deals that are completed with cash. Most of the time, there is some financing that has to be secured by the buyer and they will get financing from some third party person. Anybody that is in the business of arranging funding for a loan must have a financing license. This often is looked at as like the ugly stepsister because it is such a easy license. It's a 20 hour course and I'm not making fun of anybody. I actually hold a financing license, all right? <clears throat> so this is the person that when somebody says, hey, I wanna go get money, whom they talk to. This might be in about 5% of the cases, the first person where a buyer may say, before we call a real estate broker, let's see what we can qualify for. So they call that person. But the rest of the time you're going to see it's a real estate broker. Now, I'm going to switch over here and let's 
see all of this for a second. Because in this financing, there are two different people that the public uses these words interchangeably. You have to understand that when you and I are talking, that these words actually mean different things. So what I want you to do is somewhere in your notes, write these down. Because actually what you have is this person that is called a lender. A lender is the actual person that puts their hand in their pocket and pulls out the money. Now, before most of you go, oh, you mean like the bank? No, I'm going to burst your bubble. Banks do not have money, all right? And we will talk about this in a future chapter. Banks don't have money. Their investors have money, all right? So when you go into a bank and say, I want to borrow money to buy a house, and that guy goes, okay, come over here, sit down, let's start the process. That person actually has a uh, loan originator's license because it's not their money. The second person that people use interchangeably is this person who we call a mortgage broker. There's that word. They are, in fact, a broker, just like you and I are brokers. Only we are real estate brokers, where they are money brokers. And they bring together the buyer and the seller of money. So the buyer of money is going to be called the buyer. He's the one who's going to go get the money. And the seller of the money is actually the lender. So a mortgage broker works between the borrower of the money and the actual person that is loaning it out. So these are different people. There is a lender and there is a mortgage broker. A mortgage broker works just like we do. All right. They find the money that the borrower needs to borrow and from which lender does the mortgage broker borrow the money from? So imagine, if you will, is it possible that the buyer of a house could walk up to a house and go knock on the door and say, hey, is your house for sale? And that guy goes, no, my house is not for sale. And that buyer goes, okay, thank you, and walks out around to the next house, knocks on the door and goes, hey, is your house for sale? And that person goes, no, my house is not for sale. So the buyer goes, okay. So he gets out and goes to the, so it's possible that the buyer of a house could go to every house. Or that buyer would contact a real estate broker and say, here's what I want. Three bedroom, two bath, 1,500 square feet. And that mortgage, or I'm sorry, I misspoke. That real estate broker goes and finds all of the houses and comes back to the client and goes, Here's a list of all the houses. Which one do you want to look at? That is how we work. That same analogy works with when they're borrowing money. They could walk into a lender and go, hey, I want to borrow money, but I've got a 610 credit score. And the lender goes, sorry, we can't help you. And he goes, okay. So he goes out and goes to the next lender down the street and walks in and says, hey, I want to borrow some money. And he could see do that individually right i hope you're seeing the analogy or he could go to a mortgage broker and tell that mortgage broker one time here's what i need i've got this credit score i got this amount of the bank i make this much on a monthly basis and then the mortgage broker goes out and finds all of the lenders and comes back to that borrower of money and goes okay here's a list of all of the people that will loan you money, which one do you want to go to? And that bar borrower says, oh, let's work with that one. It's the same concept that you and I will be working on, only we do real property, they do money. 
So understand that these two people are actually different people. And you need to understand that so that when you and I talk and we talk about a company being a, well, they're a mortgage brokerage, meaning it's not their money. They're finding other lenders and a mortgage broker may have dozens, if not more lenders they work with and they shop out that person's application and go, okay, here's the list. I own a mortgage brokerage. I just told you I have a mortgage or originator's license. We deal with people like United, uh, Quicken Loans, Cardinal, um, and all kinds of different lenders. We don't loan our money out. Okay, so you have a lender and a mortgage broker. Now here's the confusion. There are some companies that actually can do both. That actually can do both. They may lend their own money in certain circumstances or they may broker that from b between another lender and the borrower. It just depends on actually, to be honest with you, that borrower. If the borrower is a strong borrower, and we're going to use that word, they may say, you know what, we'll loan our money to this guy. And then if somebody comes in that's maybe more questionable, maybe they have a little lower credit score, maybe they don't have as much in reserves in their bank, they may say, you know what, let's broker this out to another lender. So some companies can actually do both. So you have the lender and the mortgage broker are the people that we deal with.